Welcome to our another episode on origins and we're talking about the people origins, their tribes in Kenya and their origins. After talking about the Abaluya, the Luo, now we're talking about the Abagusi. They're also known the Kisi, Nkisi or Wakisi in Kiswahili, that's the another second national language of Kenya or Gusi in Ekigusi. All these are bound to ethnic groups and national indigenous to Kisi and Yamira counties of former Nyanza, as well as part of Karicho and Bomet counties of the former Rift Valley province of Kenya. The, the Abaguzi traditional, uh, traditionally inhabit Kisi and Yamira counties, as well as section of Karicho and Bomet counties, all of which were within the former Nyanza and Rift Valley province, uh, provinces of Kenya. Studies of East African Bantu languages and anthropological evidence suggest that the Abagusi, together with Kuria, Ngurumi, Rangi, Mbugwe, Simbiti, Zanaki, and Ikoma, emerged uh, from East African Neolithic agro-pastoralists and hunters, store gatherers, believed to have come from the north of Mount Elgon. It's also believed that. There was a heavy influence of uh, on the Abaguzi, Abaguzi from Bantu speakers migrating out of Central Africa and West Africa. Certain groups of the Abaguzi may have been assimilated from the Luya and Olusuba speaking Suba people, which originated from the west of Lake Victoria. The majority of Abaguzi are closely related to the Maasai, Kipsigis, Abakuria, and Abameru of Kenya. The Abagusi also have a close linguistic relationship with the Ngurumi, Rangi, Mbugwe, Simiti, Zanaki, Ikoma, and Maragoli people. They speak the Ekigusi language, which is classified with the Great Lakes Bantu speakers or Bantu languages. However, the inclusion of Abagusi in the Bantu language group is a subject of debate because there is no enough evidence to justify that. Given that studies on, on East Africa Bantu languages have found Ekigusi together with the Kuria, Simbiti, Gurumi, Rangi, and Mbugwe languages to be rather distinct from other Bantu languages in terms of structure and, and tense. The term Kisi is Swahili and originated originates from the colonial British administration who used it in a colonial uh, Kenya to refer to the Abagusi people. As it was much easier to pronounce, uh, that is when the colonialists were, you know, trying to uh, to separate and uh, uh, build their colonies in different parts of Kenya. It was easy for them to uh, pronounce the word Kisi. The term Kisi, however, has no meaning in the Ekigusi language. In the Swahili language, the singular form is Mkisi and the plural form is Wakisi. The Swahili name of Ekigusi language is Kikisi. The term is now popularly used in Kenya to refer to Abagusi people. Among the Abagusi, the name Kisi does not refer to the people but to a town. That is Kisi town, also called Bosongo or Getembe by the locals in other native urban centers of Abagusi people. The name Bosongo is believed to have originated from Abasongo, which means the whites. So when the whites went to Kisiland, that's where they camped in Kisi town. That's where they, were, that's where they, uh, they had their headquarters. The place where the whites settled, referring to settlers living in the town during the colonial era. The other name used by the British in uh, reference to Abagusi was um, Kosova or Kosoa, which is uh, uh, a deriv deriv derivative of the Ekigusi uh, expression in Kosovo, meaning their home. The antonym is Abagusi, plural, and Omugusi in singular. The language spoken by the people is Ekigusi. The term Gusi support, uh, supportedly comes from Omugusi, who is the main founder of the Kisi community. Based on linguistics, and anthropological evidence, the Abagusi originated from the Neolithic pastoralists 
inhabitants of the present day Kenya, particularly the former Nyanza and Rift Valley provinces. The competing theory by some scholars that the Abagusi migrated from Uganda is lacking enough evidence and there's no historical evidence the Abagusi settled in Uganda and have been known only to settle on the eastern slopes of, of Kenya side of Mount Elgon. The oral tradition of the Abagusi holds that their ancestors migrated from a place called Misiri, north of Mount Elgon, possibly present-day Egypt. These ancestors were the founders of six major Gusi clans, the Abagutu, Ab Abagetutu, Abanyaribari, Abagirango, Abanchari, Abamachoge, and Ababasi. This original group later absorbed a group of settlers from west of Lake Victoria, which is now presently day Uganda and Busoga. These settlers may have been assimilated from the Luya and Olusuba speaking Suba people. Present day Guziland, along with the Kenya and Eastern at large, has inhabited since um, Neolithic period. As a result, its settlers have diverse origins. The first settlers were likely hunter and hunters and gatherers similar to the Hoysan and the Ogiek, which were followed by the Nyansa Rift uh, Kushetik, who replaced these hunters and gatherers, assimilating them and settled during the savannah pastoral Neolithic period. There is uh, between 3200 and 1300 BC. The next group of settlers were Neolithic pastoralists from present day South Sudan that settled in the area Sika. That is between 500 BC. The last group to settle uh, in the area from the Bantu speakers whose migration to the area began in. Uh, uh, First century, that's first AD. Several, uh, several South Nilotic and uh, Southern Kushitic were assimilated into the Abagusi, whom are likely responsible for the Gusi practice of circumcision and other practices due to cultural diffusion. During the colonial era, the Abagusi were seen as warlike and fierce fighters by other ethnic groups, along with the Ameru. Abakuria and Masai, the Abagetutu specifically were seen as the most martial of the Abagusi clans. This perception is evident in, uh, in um, except from the Eastern uh, Protectorate Commissioner Sir Charles Elliot in early 90s expeditions of Gusi and surrounding areas and this is what he wrote, I quote, to the north of Uganda railway, the lake shows rises up into, into the Nanti County and Usiangishu Plateau. To the south is a little region lying between the Mao Range and Lake, uh, Lake Victoria, thickly inhabited by the Kavirondo and rich in cattle. Kosova or Kisi is a hilly district behind Ugaya and is one of the least people, at least known parts of the protectorate. The inhabitants appear to be Bantu speaking and have a bad reputation of ferocity, but this may merely mean that they have a, a, a hered hereditary feud uh, with their neighbors who are not Bantu and does not necessarily imply that well, they will be hostile to the Europeans. The warlike nature was deemed as a threat to British rule, especially the cattle camps. The warriors frequented and the British enacted punitive expedition that raided cattle and rushed the warriors. This slowly brought an end to the pastoral and war-based lifestyle of most Abagusi. The British introduced new immigra immigrants to Kisi County and other parts of Kenya in the 1930s to work as soldiers, porters, and farmers. These were the Baganda the Maragoli, the Nubi, and Olusuva-speaking Suba people of Kenya from Rusinga Island, Mfangano Island, and section of Homer Bay County. The Nubians were settled by the British in present-day Kisi town and worked as soldiers for the British government, while the Bantu-speaking Maragoli, Baganda, 
and Suba people were settled in Kisi town as porters and laborers on white farms and tea plantations. Some of the new immig immigrants introduced to Kisi town by the British have been largely assimilated into the Gusi society, but others, particularly the Nubi, never assimilated and still maintain their origin settlements in Kisi town. The relationship between the Abagusi and the neighboring erotic speaking communities such as the Maasai, Nandi, Kipsigis and Luo is often painted negatively on social media. The colonial perception of Nilotic as, uh, uh, as more hostile and warlike have continued to persist in the wider Kenyan discourse as evidenced by works of scholars and researchers such as Ocheng and Ogot among others these scholars have exploited such colonial stereotypes and largely stereotyped the nilotic speaking communities in their works. Despite these stereotypes, the Abagusi have often maintained a positive relationship with their nilotic neighbors in the pre, pre and post colonial era. Prior to colonial, colonial, colonization, the Abagusi engaged in barter trade with these communities, especially the Luo people and at times worked together to defeat the cat riders. So this coexistence between the Abagusi and their neighboring uh, Nilotic communities was largely peaceful despite, despite these communities in Abagusi occasionally clashing, sometimes violent, cattle rustle, rustle, rustle and grazing land conflicts. The modern usage of the term Bantu was only developed in 19th century with the advent of European colonization. Prior to colonization, no such division existed in Africa. Africa was one, the spirit of Ubuntu. These categories of Africa spoke uh, Africa people into uh, distinct internally homogeneous groups is seen as generalizing at best, the inaccurate at worst, in the context of the Abagusi together with Kuria, Zanaki, Ikoma, Rangi, Mbugwe, Ngurumi, and Simbiti, some linguistic and cultural evidence indicate that they may be more influenced by the Nautic and Kushiti communities than other Bantu groups. So during the pre-colonial uh, pre era, the Abagusi cultivated finger millet, uh, barley, pumpkin, and other native crops ox drawn plow and iron hose were used for cultivating crops. However, the Abagusi were mainly pastoralists and hunter, hunter and hunter gatherers who primarily relied on the cat on their cattle, god, sheep, and lesser extent poultry for food. In the 19th century, Europeans introduced tea, coffee, bananas, and plantains, and most importantly, maize by the 1920s. Maize quickly replaced finger millet and sorghum as a staple food cash crop. By 1930s, tea and coffee had become major cash crops within the Kisi. Today, the Abagusi still continue to keep livestock and poultry alongside farming, along with old cultural practices. Uh, some crops are cult uh, cultivate, cultivated today, including cassava, potatoes, tomatoes, bananas, beans, onions, tropical fruits, and peas, among others. Farmers remain dominant activity uh, in Guziland due to high population density. During the pre-colonial period, again, uh, Abogusi produced iron tools, weapons, uh, decorations, wooden implements, pottery, and baskets. And the iron tools that they produced were made them more fierce to other communities. That was gave, gave them a higher hand when it came to war or cattle wrestling. The Abagusi also imported pottery from a neighboring Luo community, blacksmiths, and other occupations that worked with the iron and iron ore were highly respected and influential members of the Abagusi community, despite not farming a distinct societal caste. Smithing was largely carried out by men. The primary form, form of trade carried out in pre-colonial times was barter and mostly took place within homesteads as well as with neighboring communities, especially the Luo tools, weapons, crafts, 
livestock and agricultural products were commonly exchanged. Cattle were in an important form of currency and goats uh, served a lower valued currency. But our trades between the Abagusi and the Lua took place at the border markets and Abagusi farms and was mainly carried out by women. In modern age, the Abagusi have established shopping, shopping centers, shops, and markets, further connecting them to the rest of the country, as opposed to their, you know, comparatively isolated pre-colonial economics. Uh, traditionally, the Abagusi society divided labor between men and women. Women were expected to cook, uh, brew, uh, clean, cultivate, and process crops and fetch water and firewood. Men were expected to herd, build houses and fences, clear crops fields, among other duties. Men were less involved in crop cultivation compared to women. Herding was primarily carried out by boys and unmarried men and girls and unmarried women helped with crop cultivation. This division of labor was carried down over time and have gradually taken over many of the men's traditional duties. Among the Abagusi circumcision, uh, circumcising boys without anesthesia around 10 years is an important rite of passage. Girls were, uh, girls also have a similar rite of passage undergoing female, female genital mutilation at an earlier age. Traditionally, the Abagusi did not marry into tribes that did not practice circumcision. Though this practice has declined in recent generations, the ritual typically takes place every year in the months of November and December, followed by a period of seclusion where the boys are led into different activities by older boys and girls led into uh, by older girls. During this period, only older circumcised boys and girls are allowed to visit the initiates. It is considered a taboo for anyone else to visit during this time. It is a period of isolation. The male initiates are taught their roles as young women, young men in the community and the code of contact of circumcised man, a circumcised man. Initiated boys and girls were also taught the rules of shame, chisoni, chinsoni, respect, and respect, ogosika, ogosika. This is a time of celebration for families and the community at large. Family, friends, and neighbors are invited days in advance by the candidates to join the family celebration. Prior to introduction of Christianity and Islam to Africa, the Abagusi were monotheistic, believing in a supreme god called Engoro. This god is also popularly called Nyasai, loanword from the Olu language among Abagusi. The Abagusi believed that Engoro or Engoro created the universe and was the source of all life, the sun. Risase and the stars are both important in the Abagusi religion. Death, diseases, and destruction of crops and livestock were considered a natural event brought on by evil spirits, bad luck, witchcraft, or displeasure of the ancestor, ancestor spirits. The Abagusi also revered medicine men and practiced ancestor worship, calling the ancestors spirits. Evirecha, evirecha. Totally most of Abagusi practice, uh, practice Christianity with the four major denominations being Catholic, Seventh-day, Adventist Church, and Swedish uh, Lutheranism and Pentecostal Assemblies of God. A minority of Abagusi still adhere to their traditional religion and other observed syncretic form of the tradition, religion, and Christianity. Many still go to visit a diviner, Omoragori, and who can point out displeased spirits of the dead and prescribe a solution on placating them. Traditionally, marriage was arranged by parents whose intermediaries called 
chisangani chisangani or chisangani these intermediaries acted as referees for the future bride and groom after the parent negotiated the dowry the wedding would be organized the wedding ceremony involved a mentor called an omai mari omoi mari who could provide continuing support to the new married couple marriage between members of the same clan was traditionally forbidden marriage was officially established through the payment of dowry in the form of cattle to the wife's family afterwards the man and the woman are officially considered husband and wife divorce is customarily not allowed among the abagusi as marriage is considered permanent union in, in all that is only disrupted by death currently civil and christian marriages are recognized among the abagusi the typical gusi family unit is composed of a man his wives and their children living on the same land was divided into two components the homestead omushie omuchie and the cattle camps evisarate married man his wives and their unmarried daughters and uncircumcised boys lived in the omochie the evisarate situated in the grazing fields was protected by the male warriors to defend theft by cattle rustlers and raiders a typical goosey house was conical grass thatched roofs and is typical round for sometimes rectangular in shape today goosey houses are still similar though corrugated iron sheets and stone is sometimes used for the roof and the walls the traditional gusi compound header elevated granaries for storing crops such as millet and other crops the abagusi customarily built fortified walls and dug trenches around these homesteads and villages to protect against cattle rustling and raids by neighboring communities however in 1913 the cattle camps were abolished by the british forcing abagusi to live in dispersed homesteads the original diet of abagusi prior to colonization consisted of meat milk and blood from livestock cereals from millet and sorghum as well as fruits vegetables birds edible insects chintunga and wild meat obtained from hunting and gathering post colonial diet of abagusi in other uh, african tribes has been transformed and influenced by interactions with the european colonialists that introduced new crops and farming methods in guziland and africa the step staple meal is ookema which is a dish of millet flour or sorghum flour cooked with water to a hardened dough like cons consistency it is often served with rinagu or chinsaga ikuneni and enderema emboga omote pesoza egesare among other local uh, green leaves consumed by as vegetables it is served with milk particularly sour milk from livestock it can also be served with any other stew the ekegusi word for having meal is ragera usually connotes a meal involving awokema at the center by 1920s maize was introduced into guziland and uh, had overtaken finger millet and sorghum as staple crop and cash crop as a result maize is now largely used to prepare awokema and it okay pulor uh, amatoke a dish of cooked and flavored bananas is a popular snack but is considered a supplement food and not a proper meal thank you so much for following on to us there is part 2 or part 1 of the gusi people leave your comment
and your thoughts on what do you think that we have left out that you have not talked about and we will cover it let us know and teach us as we teach you too on our origins goosey origin party one waiting for party two sooner